Hello and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast. I'm your host, Heather Tesco, and I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and our connection to our own humanity. This is episode 49. It's another joint episode with Melita Thomas of Tudor Times. This is the fourth joint episode that we've done together. And I'm so excited to do a lot more original content with them. Just a quick note that the Renaissance English History Podcast is a proud member of the Agora Podcast Network. The Agora Podcast of the Month this month is The History of China by Chris Stewart. You can check it out and learn more at thehistoryofchina.wordpress.com or look it up on iTunes or Stitcher or your listening service of choice. And as always, you can get show notes and more information about the Renaissance English History Podcast at www.englandcast.com, where you can also sign up for my mailing list. Mailing list subscribers receive extra mini casts each month, as well as book giveaways, news, and lots of other cool stuff. For this particular episode as well, you can also get lots more information on James I at tutortimes.co.uk. So moving on from the admin bit, let's talk about James the first now. So introducing Melita, Melita is a co-founder and editor of Tudor Times, a website devoted to Tudor and Stuart history in the period from 1485 to 1625. You can find it at tutortimes.co.uk. Melita, who has always been fascinated by history ever since she saw the 1970s series Elizabeth R. with Glenda Jackson, also contributes articles to BBC History Extra and Britain Magazine. So Melita, can you tell us a bit about James's life? I know it was a very full life. Can you just give us the highlights? It certainly was a full life. He, he, he's been rather neglected by historians in the past, but his life was absolutely, you know, one, one Hollywood scene after another. The excitement started before he was born, when he was still in the womb, his mother's apartments were broken into and her secretary was murdered in front of her eyes whilst one of the assassins held a gun to her pregnant belly. So James was already the centre of, of excitement, even while he was a, you know, uh, still a fetus. Fortunately for James and for Mary, he was born healthy, although at a later stage in life it was noted that he didn't walk terribly well and he had possibly some sort of speech impediment, which people have speculated may have been a birth problem related to the difficulties that, that Mary had when, when he was actually born. But following even on from that, that early fracas, his mother was deposed when he was about a year old and James became King of Scotland at the age of 13 months. He was unsurprisingly subject to a good deal of controversy in his youth as to whether he ought to be king. Many people wanted his mother restored and there were a number of tussles o over who, who was going to rule Scotland. There was the, the Queen's party who thought Mary should be restored and the King's party that wanted James as king under the regency of his, um, and originally of his half-uncle, Murray. Of the four regents who ruled for James, two were assassinated including his aforementioned uncle, his grandfather. One died possibly of poison, the Earl of Mar, who had been his guardian, and the fourth was eventually executed by James himself. Mm. So for the first 10 or 12 years of his life, there was a, a civil war in Scotland that effectively the government won, but there, were, you know, there was always the possibility that it might go the other way. Uh, James was largely protected from this, and he was brought up with a, in a very, very strict educational environment. He was hugely well-educated. He spoke several languages. He could write in Latin. He learnt – he had a very academic type of education. His, his chief tutor was a chap called George Buchanan, who was also the tutor to the French philosopher, the Montaigne, which is, which is quite an interesting link. And James was – encouraged to hone his skills in rhetoric. He also wrote poetry and he wrote a number of books in later life. Not, not particularly long books, but there's his famous book about witchcraft called Demonology. And he wrote a book for his son 
on how a king should rule called the Basilicon Doron, which was later published in several languages, translated into um, French, Italian, also Welsh, interestingly, for his Welsh subjects. Once he was about 13, James really started to take authority for himself and he formulated a a sort of a life plan that he never really deviated from in that he would, I suppose lie is, is the right word, but dissimulate. He would listen to both sides of the question. You know, each side thought he agreed with them and then he would just go ahead and do what he'd already planned to do. But he was very good at conciliation and compromise and he, he disliked violence intensely from this rather worrying youth that he'd had. So having started to take power at 13, he was then kidnapped uh, held by the Earl of Gowrie and his colleagues for about 18 months while he was you know, pretty much forced to rule the country as they required. But then by rather clever stratagems, he managed to escape from Gowrie's influence and promised that he was going to be a universal king who would rule without faction, which he tried to do, not always successfully. He married in 1589 to a Danish princess, Anne, and he and Anne had seven children. They were reasonably happy together, as arranged marriages go, but there was always a question about whether James certainly had homosexual leanings, even if he didn't actually have homosexual relationships. And it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a tricky subject, that, because it, his fondness for his male favourites was was commented on at the time. He would kiss them and be physically affectionate. And yet his actual statements on the topic of um, homosexual acts were very, very traditional Calvinist view, you might say. He was very anti it. He believed that homosexual acts should be severely punished. Um, so perhaps he didn't see himself as, as a lover of men but he had very warm emotional relationships and you know to some extent a physical relationship with them so it's it's quite a quite a conundrum really or perhaps he was just a man who was hugely physically affectionate which he couldn't indulge in his childhood and it came out in a fondness for for other men his overall ambition was always to be king of england that was that was what he wanted this sometimes put him in a bit of a moral quandary particularly when his mother had been uh, tried and was going to be executed by the English government. He had little power to actually change what the English government was going to do. But on the other hand, he felt obliged to um, remonstrate and to ask that his mother's life be spared. The Scots, having deposed Mary, were very upset at the thought that the English might try to execute her. Um, which <laughs> perhaps seems a little paradoxical. Right. And James was the recipient of a, of a pension from England, which was very useful, which he didn't want to lose. And also he was a committed Protestant and his mother was a Catholic. So he had all sorts of conflicting feelings about the matter. Mm. He became King of England in 1603 and his view was that the two countries should should unite, but he was the only person who had any interest in that idea at all. Um, mm -hmm. Even once he became King of England, the plots and the assassination attempts and so forth continued, particularly, of course, the gunpowder plot, the most, most famous plot of all, um, which he was fortunate to escape. Was a re reasonably successful King of England. He brought peace with Spain after 20 years of war. He had reopened relationships really with with Europe he was less divisive in the in the sort of protestant catholic divide in Europe than Elizabeth had been and he established much friendlier relationships with the catholic countries of Europe than she had done and he also although he uh, was was in no way going to encouraged Catholicism, he was personally inclined to toleration and did not want to get involved in religious persecution. He was also successful. He, had, he left a son. He had an older son who died very 
sadly, uh, to, to, Hen- to James's great grief, Henry Frederick, Prince of Wales. But he left a son. He left uh, a daughter who was married to the King of Bohemia. And, of course, he is the ancestor of all the subsequent uh, kings and queens of Great Britain. So his early life was so tumultuous, like you said, even before he was born, and he didn't know his father or his mother, really. How do you think that affected him later? I know you talked about it a little bit, perhaps, with his relationships with men. Um, How else did that come out at all? Or how do you think it would have affected him just this early tumult that he had? I think it made him well, I, th- I think by nature he was probably a, a trusting man, but I think this, the fear of his, in his childhood, the constant plots, I think that made him untrusting against his nature. And I think that explains why on a number of occasions when his friends uh, betrayed him or let him down, he was endlessly forgiving. A lot of, a lot of plots against him were... I mean, perhaps it was weakness rather than rather than virtue, but he seemed always willing to accept that people um, did love him and did care about him, did want. He's very insecure emotionally, so so a, a good show of, of of loving him or or being fond of him was always always very welcome. He was he was attached mm-hmm. to his wife, um, although they they weren't temperamentally particularly well suited, and he was very attached to his own children. I think it probably made him lonely, I suppose, and perhaps also encouraged him in his idea of the absolute power of kings, which was very contrary to the the formal education that he had. George Buchanan, in a, a rather nice quote, when he was a, when he was a little boy, uh, James was probably about eight or nine. Buchanan had beaten him for you know, insubordination or not doing his Latin homework or whatever it was. And the uh, Countess of Mar, he was he was in the care of the Earl and Countess of Mar. The Countess complained that Buchanan had, had beaten him and said that he should not put his hands on the Lord's anointed, to which Buchanan replied that he had whipped the king's ass and Lady Mar could kiss it if she felt like it. <laughs> so he was certainly not brought up with this idea of absolute power, but it was one he mm-hmm. he came by perhaps in the uh, first relationship that he developed with somebody who hadn't been appointed by his guardians. The Duke mm-hmm. of Lennox, his cousin, was born and brought up in France, uh, came to Scotland, was a good deal older than James, but James completely hero-worshipped him mm. and was very, very willing to listen to ideas about uh, the power of kings, perhaps as a as an antidote to the powerlessness of his childhood. And what would that have been like for him? He was Elizabeth's presumptive heir, but he was never formally acknowledged as such, was he? And and how? What? It's a very odd position to be in, isn't it? Elizabeth was an absolute genius at keeping people dangling. And James was no exception. If you think of all those men she almost married but never did. And in, in a way, James was treated in exactly the same way. He, she would hint that he was her heir and then add that failure to do exactly what she wanted would mean him being struck off the list. They regularly corresponded. She always took a very dominant role, would criticise his actions, reprove them, but then become absolutely enraged if he questioned anything that she did. And she wouldn't let him rest secure. Mm -hmm. So she would toy with other possible options, such as uh, the Lady Arbella Stewart, who was um, their mutual cousin. Um, Mm -hmm. And she was being brought up in England. So every now and then Elizabeth would would parade Arbella around just to um, keep James on his toes. But Mm -hmm. the, the risk for James was also that he became the subject of plotting by some of Elizabeth's nobles and ministers who were you know, perhaps looking to the future or particularly in the 1590s when Elizabeth was losing her grip on power in some ways because a younger generation didn't necessarily approve of her uh, foreign policy and particularly in relation to Spain. So men like the Earl of Essex and his sister, Lady Penelope Devereux, wrote ingratiating letters to James during the 1590s assuring him of their 
loyalty and that they would support him in his um, bid for the throne if if necessary, all completely treasonous. James was um, Mm. a sensible chap and he didn't get too involved in that sort of correspondence. He would just politely thank them for their letters and, and ignore the the hints um, because he was in a difficult position when the plots that James's mother Mary was accused of were at their height in the early 1580s a thing called the Act of Association had been introduced by the English Parliament and that meant that anybody who profited or benefited from the assassination of the Queen would be immediately struck out of the succession, even if they'd had nothing to do with it. Mm-hmm. So if mm-hmm. James was in any way appearing to encourage a- anybody to think that Elizabeth should be got out of the way, he would automatically be debarred from the throne. So he had to be, mm-hmm. he had to be fairly circumspect. He must have been so good at just treading around all these different, I don't know, relationships and how to manage all these different relationships with people. It's uh I don't envy him. Anyway, uh, so tell me a little bit about what he believed, his religious beliefs. You kind of talked about it earlier with his his book on witchcraft and his views. It seems like he had some very, like you said, almost Calvinist beliefs. And he obviously was involved with the King James Bible. So can you tell me a little bit about what he believed religiously? Uh, James was brought up in the Reformed faith as it was instituted in Scotland by the Confession of Faith, which was passed by the Scots Parliament in 1560. It was a Calvinist interpretation of Christianity, and he he remained firmly in that form of, of Protestantism. He, he was a Calvinist. He defended it with his pen, if not necessarily with his sword. However, within the Church of Scotland, there was a more radical branch which believed that church government should be by uh, presbyteries and superintendents. So it's all rather arcane, but the principle was that the elders and ministers of the church should be chosen by the congregations, whereas James... Mm wanted a very much more traditional type of church structure where the king chose the bishops and it was imposed from the top and there was control over the church by by the state. Whereas the the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland believed that they ought to be effectively independent of the state and not only that, but that the king and the civil authorities should actually be guided, to put it mildly, by the Kirk. Now, James, you mm-hmm. know, no, no self-respecting king was going to be very keen on that that idea. So there was a long-standing mm-hmm. battle between the the, the Kirk, as, as, as it was called in Scotland, and James as to who was in charge. Mm-hmm. This was reflected at in England as well, towards the end of the 16th century, as the the Puritan branch of the Church of England wanted to move to the 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 model that the the Scots Presbyterians had, uh, mm-hmm. and this this was a, a, a constant source of conflict. Mm-hmm. He was pretty tolerant of other people's religions. I mean, Catholicism was never prosecuted in Scotland or never persecuted in Scotland the way it was in England. In England, although a number of the nobles were still Catholic and everybody knew they were, they kept pretty quiet about it. In Scotland, particularly in the north and the highlands, Catholicism was still pretty widely practised. Um, but it was, you know, it, it was a bone of contention throughout his reign. When he became king in England, he had allowed the English Catholics to believe that he would be more tolerant than Elizabeth had been in his his favourite trick of allowing people to, to pretty much believe that he agreed with them, even if he didn't. And the fact that he didn't immediately institute any kind of tolerance was really one of the motivating factors behind the gunpowder plot. The Catholics felt that they had been uh, let down, lied to, betrayed, and their idea was that... Um, James should be over, overthrown, replaced with his daughter as a puppet queen. She was she was 
a toddler at the time. So that was part of their motivation. He mm -hmm. always, as I say, wanted the, 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 the traditional ecclesiastical hierarchy. He succinctly put it as no bishop, no king, which of course became true in, in the days of his son, Charles I, when, when Scotland firmly rejected the, the Episcopalian model. Uh, but one of the ideas he had to bring together um, the various factions was the new translation of the Bible, the King James Authorised Version, as we call it now. In 1604, he summoned what was called the Hampton Court Conference to do a new, to make a new translation of the Bible. Uh, the, there were various different Bibles being used throughout uh, the British Isles. There was the Geneva Bible, which was strongly Calvinist in tone. Uh, no, I mentioned the bishops in that. Uh, but that had been very popular since the 1560s. There was the Bishop's Bible, which was based on the 1539 Bible, and, but was more or less a translation directly from the Latin, without much reference to original sources. And there was the Douai Bible that was smuggled in by Catholics. So in 1601, the Scottish General Assembly had mooted the idea of a new translation, which they would have had a, a Presbyterian interpretation, and James was eager to avoid that. So the Hampton Court Conference was convened to undertake a new translation, but to base it on the, the Bishop's Bible. It was undertaken by committee, mm. and finally published in 1611. Although when I say finally, if you think seven years is not very long when you consider the huge scale of the task. Uh, the King James Authorised Version of the Bible is the best-selling book ever published in English. And although there have been subsequent later translations and updates, it, it is still the cornerstone of, of the traditional Anglican church. So uh, a, a great contribution to literature, whatever one's... Um, religious views might be mm -hmm. on it. Okay, well, you mentioned the gunpowder plot twice now. Um, you talked about just now the motivations of, of the plotters. Can you, for people who don't know what the gunpowder plot is, um, which might be people in America who don't celebrate every November uh, with fireworks yes. and bonfires <laughs> and things like that. Yeah. Um, can, you, can you give me the brief uh, kind of overview of what the gunpowder uh, well uh, yes we still we still remember it with but i know we could do like lots of episodes on this as well but so you know <laughs> remember remember the 5th of november yes. gunpowder treason and plot yeah um so as i mentioned before the catholic party in england had hoped that uh with the accession of james there would be more tolerance of their religion in particular the uh, it, it was a, a capital offence to be a priest if you had, if you were um, ordained after the death of, of Queen Mary in 1558, and it was a capital offence to hear the mass said. There was a huge underground network of people who hid priests, who organised masses, who kept Catholicism alive uh, during during the years of Elizabeth's reign. Mm -hmm. And they hoped that they would be able to come out into the open, but it, that was not not James's um, decision. There was a, a plot that was developed in the summer of sixteen hundred and five. And if you want to read some detail about this, I can't uh, recommend highly enough Jesse Child's book God's Traitors, which goes into this in, in huge detail and explains the religious and political background. Uh, but the idea was that uh, the young Princess Elizabeth, who, as I said, was a, was a few years old at the time, would be kidnapped and that the Houses of Parliament or the House of Parliament would be blown up by gunpowder. Uh, we shouldn't imagine Parliament as it is today, the buildings in Westminster Square. Uh, parliamentary meetings usually took place in, in the Great Hall in Westminster or um, in the Palace of Westminster it's, itself, which which burnt in in the nineteenth century, so the the ringleaders were a chap. There was a chap called Robert Catesby. There was 
Thomas Percy, who was a brother or cousin, I can't remember which, of the Earl of Northumberland, and a number of others. There were, there were about eight or ten of them in total. And the most famous one is uh, Guy Fawkes, although he actually hadn't been privy to the original plot. He, was, he got involved later. Anyway, these young men who were, uh, they were all cousins and closely related, uh, they they came up with this rather ludicrous prop, really. And they rented a house next door to uh, where where the parliament was, was due to sit. And they smuggled in loads and loads of barrels of gunpowder. Now, why anybody could think that um, you could smuggle in loads of barrels of gunpowder and that that was mm-hmm. <laughs> a, a, a practical proposition, I'm not quite sure. However, they, they did manage to get some in. And... Then the the plan was that Guy Fawkes would hide in the cellars with the gunpowder and set light to it. So far as is known, he wasn't a suicide bomber. The plan was that he would actually get out in time, although, you know, again, with 16th century, 17th century gunpowder, that might have been, <laughs> might have been unlikely. However, one of the plotters was concerned that this wouldn't just blow up the king, because in those days the king attended parliament and probably the Prince of Wales, who as he was uh, about 15, so he was likely to be in attendance in parliament as well, but would also blow up um, Catholic members of parliament, including this particular plotter's own brother-in-law, Lord Monteagle. Mm. He wrote to Monteagle, or sent him an anonymous letter, so it's not absolutely certain, because, but it, this is assumed that it was Monteagle's brother-in-law, sent him a an anonymous letter saying, don't attend Parliament. Mm-hmm. It's not going to end well. Anyway, Monteagle, although he was Catholic himself, um, you know, suspected that something was afoot. And he went to James and said he'd received this letter and uh, a search was ordered of the cellars underneath Parliament and there was Guy Fawkes found with his, with his gar- barrels of gunpowder. The other plotters uh, got wind of the fact that he'd been found and they uh, rode hell for leather for um, various places in the Midlands that were safe houses. One of them is Coat and Court. Uh, and, but they were eventually rounded up and executed. Mm-hmm. So it was, I mean, the, the downside, of course, was that whatever tolerance James might have been inclined to show you know, was was damaged because he then became much more anti-Catholic than he had previously sure. been. So what was it like for him um, ruling both England and Scotland? I'd like to hear a little bit about, you know, kind of what the relationships between the countries were like then and, and just kind of how things changed under one ruler. From... James's point of view, in some ways, it was easier to rule England than to rule Scotland, mm-hmm. partly because England was a lot wealthier, so finally he had some money in his pocket. He'd, he'd always been very poor, and he was notoriously bad with money. Whenever he had it, he, he spent it, not so much on himself as on his favourites, and Queen Anne was ludicrously extravagant. Mm-hmm. So, so he had more money. And it was also easier in that the noble class, which was still very independent in Scotland, had been more or less beaten into submission by the Tudors and didn't give James a great deal of trouble. Mm -hmm. The Puritan element in the church, which I mentioned before, was growing, but it didn't control the church as it had in Scotland with its uncomfortable ideas about democracy. James himself very much wanted the two countries to be truly united, but he was the only person with any any interest in that as a concept. He announced that he would be known as the King of Great Britain. Mm-hmm. And following his accession, all of the princely houses of Europe addressed their letters to the King of Great Britain. He, th- There was a good deal of continuity in government in both places. He didn't try to bring uh, Scottish ministers into office in England and nor did he put English men into office in Scotland which would have um, been very unpopular on both sides he retained Elizabeth's ministers particularly Sir Robert Cecil Mm -hmm. he instituted a council to govern Scotland and did promise that he would continually visit although he only actually went back once 
in his uh, 22 years in England. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he was probably quite relieved. It was that he had a, an easier life. The palaces of England were legion compared with the, the smallish number in Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, he did have many, many members of his court were, were Scottish and he did bring a whole a whole entourage with him who remained with him. So he still thought of himself as Scots in that sense. Um, but at a lower level, the English and Scottish people did not in any way feel united. They shared a king, but that was that. Was that. Even the, uh, the church was different. As I said, the, the ecclesiastical structure was different. There was a change in the borders where the previously there'd been, you know, pretty much permanent low-level border warfare, it changed in that it was no longer state-sponsored, but there was still a good deal of lawlessness perpetrated by the the Reavers, as they were called. Mm. Interesting book about that. Uh, George MacDonald Fraser's book, The Steel Bonnets, all about this period of the, uh, uh, of the life in the borders in the early days of James. <laughs> they were a bloody lot, that's <laughs> for sure. <laughs> But there was no real meeting of minds. And in fact, in the Civil War in the 1640s, England and Scotland were were at uh, loggerheads. It wasn't until more than 80 years after James's death in the days of his great granddaughter, Queen Anne, that he that um, the, the, the countries were united under a single parliament. What about culture and the arts? He was a he was a great fan of pageants and pageantry and everything like that, wasn't he? He was, and particularly his his wife Anne of Denmark. She was she was particularly interested in in, in masquerades and ballets and that kind of mixing of cultures between dance and music and and so forth. She was also very interested in architecture. Mm -hmm. James enjoyed play going. Uh, not long after he came to the throne. Uh, Shakespeare's company, which had previously been sponsored by the Lord Chamberlain, became the King's Company and played in front of James on at least 150 occasions. He was also perhaps more interested in in literature than he was in, in music. He was not, unlike all of his Tudor and Stuart relatives, he had no ear for music at all and didn't care a great deal for dancing. Mm -hmm. Although apparently when he was young, he wasn't wasn't bad at it mm. but he, his interest was literature uh i mentioned the demonology that he wrote his book about witchcraft his book about how how people should rule how kings should rule he also wrote a number of sonnets not more than okay you know they're not mm -hmm. not great great poetry but he wrote a number of other things he wrote a diatribe against tobacco which is which is quite amusing <laughs> really he refers to it as loathsome and uh, yes, in, in very disparaging terms, um, he wrote uh, a number of religious works, you know, interpretations of, of parts of the Bible and another, well, sort of semi-religious, semi-political work. Uh, after the gunpowder plot, a new oath of allegiance was implemented that James required his subjects to swear to. And this was an oath saying that the Pope had no power to depose a secular ruler. And this caused, this oath caused a good deal of controversy across Europe, actually. And there were a number of theologians, both Protestant and Catholic, who wrote on, wrote about this, this oath. And James himself took up the pen to defend it and to make clear that his interpretation of the oath it wasn't a, it wasn't about the catholic religion it was about the power the secular power of popes over uh, temporal kings and in fact there were many catholic mm -hmm. uh, kings who who were very happy with this philosophy that the popes should not have um, have power to have them deposed so he was he was quite a nimble writer shall we say mhm mm mhm mm interesting so 
where else can we go to learn more about James? There's obviously he's the person of the month now. So there's your resources. What other resources can you recommend? Uh, he hasn't been the subject of many biographies. There's uh, John Matusiak's book, James the First, Scotland's King of England. That's fairly recent. Um, Matusiak writes in quite an entertaining style. Chapel Robert Steddall has written two books the Challenge to the Crown and the Survivor of the Crown, which look in detail at the period of James's youth and how he transformed the turbulence and the four regencies of his childhood into a reasonably stable government. Uh, Jesse's Child's God's Traitors that I mentioned before, which deals with the gunpowder plot. Mm -hmm. uh, Leander Delisle covers the English years in a lot of detail in After Elizabeth. And if you're interested in the witchcraft angle, then Tracy Borman's uh, book, Witches, um, is, is, is good. It looks at a particular witch hunt in England after James became king. So, yes, mm -hmm. those are all worth, worth a look. Is there anything else that we should know about James that you'd like to share with us? I, I think James has been very underrated. He, from a war-torn country, he created a stable Scottish state. He succeeded peacefully in England. He ended the war with Spain. He stopped the royal nursery. He made alliances with both Protestant and Catholic countries. He sought compromise and negotiation wherever he could. And as before mentioned, he gave the English language the gift of the authorised version. Nice. Regardless of one's religious position, a great work of literature. Yes. So overall, I would say he... He had 56 or 57 years of pretty effective kingship. That's great. Thank you again so much to Melita Thomas for taking the time to tell us all about James. Please go to their website, tutortimes.co.uk, for their person of the month information, all about James, everything you wanted to know about James, and more. You can also go to the resources available on the EnglandCast site at englandcast.com. Thank you so much for listening. Talk to you soon.